Does anyone remember these images? The cowboys, the old west, the bank robbers had come riding into town with their bandanas over their face, rob the bank, or they go charging and rob the train. But they did have a practical use too, and it was to stop the dust. Do you remember those days? And then not so long ago, anywhere you went, it seemed like they were telling you to take more and more off so that their facial recognition could ensure that they knew who you were. But before that, there was still the threat that when you wore a mask, well, if you weren't doing it to keep out the dust or protect your head as in this circumstance, why were you wearing it? Usually in the commission of a crime. So that's why they say, remove your hood, your cap, your helmet, your sunglasses, oh, and your gun too. Get rid of all those things before you can enter because you're going to be a threat. So we need to see who you are just for security purposes. Just so we can identify you if you turn around and try to rob the place. But now, well, we've got a bunch of masked bandits. <laughs> So it just came to me. Let's just stop it there. Mass bandits. Look at the contradiction. We've got on the one hand that before all this, they're saying, we want to see your face, we want to know who you are, you know, before you come into a shop. Now they're saying, you've got a mask up, we want you to conceal yourself and that's the only way you'll get into a shop. So you're actually creating a security risk for them because what if you did decide to pull out a gun and rob <laughs> the place? What are they gonna look for? Someone in a mask? Know your enemy. And know yourself. As this uh, wise saying says here, first you need to know yourself and then know your enemy and then you will be successful. But if you are lacking in either one or both, your success is not guaranteed or even guaranteed at all and anything you do get will only be a half measure because you need to know who your enemy is, what their weaknesses are if you have any attempt to bring them down and you also need to know yourself because unless you have the capacity to accurately depict your enemy and act accurately depict your own skills, you will not be successful in your encounters. If you know both, you can control the whole scenario. And I think this, this one just says it all. Crisis actors are not new. In fact, they've been employed more and more. There are professional websites that offer crisis actors for businesses to create simulations for their own purposes. They are widely used. And this is why also too that um, a lot of the people that have appeared in so-called real shootings and massacres 
They're really unlucky people. One poor girl, I've seen her in four different ones. So we know about crisis actors and if you don't know about crisis actors, go have a look for yourself. They've been around for a long time, they're paid professionals and a lot of the stuff that you see on TV is a video made by crisis actors presented as news and then anyone that calls it out, they're called conspiracy theorists. Well, there's a certain amount of it that's actually fact and you've got to find that out for yourself. We're going to get on to the medical industry, one of my favourite subjects. I haven't had a good experience with them ever since I was a kid and I've never trusted what they said because, well, when, when I first encountered them they didn't know what was going on, they couldn't give me answers and they were rude to me. I didn't like them right from the word go. But one thing that's also bothered me too is that uh, doctors take the Hippocratic Oath um, even though they spell hypocrite with an H-I-P-P instead of an H-Y-P it's the same thing a hypocrite and that's why over here on the left hand side of the image I've got about Herodotus being called the father of lies, Plato who's been called a storyteller of fiction, then could Hippocrates be the father of hypocrites? So the oath of Hippocrates or the Hippocratic oath that all medical staff take first to do no harm now, I've known the hypocrisy of the medical field for years and on the odd occasion I've been lucky enough to find doctors that have spoken honestly to me about what they know of the hypocrisy. And it's like all cops know that corruption and all that stuff is in the police force. All doctors know the corruption within their own field as well. And you think, but they're doctors, they've got the best intentions at heart. How could they be corrupt? Well, we've got nurses and doctors coming out now saying they work in a corrupt system. Uh, if you can't believe the professionals that have been blindly, you know, just going along with it until all the, the shit has hit the fan, and then all of a sudden they've realised, you know what? This is life and death stuff that here we are killing people, deliberately lying. We are supposed to be healing and helping people and we are deliberately helping uh, to do things that is criminal. So the symbol that the medical industry um, use, that they all use, You've got two of them. You've got that little red cross which everyone recognises. And straight away you should look at it and go, red, danger. <laughs> but anyway, it's always red. It's never a different colour. And as I noted down the bottom, if you turn it on, on its side, well, that tells you wrong answer. And maybe if Hippocrates is the father of hypocrites, Maybe it is the wrong answer. So you look at the symbol, and the symbol here, I'm just going to touch briefly on a little bit of Egyptian mythology. I studied the uh, hieroglyphs of it quite a few years ago, and also did it again last year, and really looked at in depth into it. Now the symbol of the Kajikus, or however you say it, is uh, the winged soul, the Heka staff, bound by two serpents, as I've explained here. Now, in Egyptian mythology, 
the Amduat is full of serpents and most of those serpents are actually good they light the way they are what creates the light in the darkness the light the spirit the fire it um, it's hard to define what they represent but they breathe it out and like many things that are created from other things these things are self-creating they are not reliant upon anything else so basically they are um, the primal power and if you look at the Amduat it is a journey through the hours and the divisions where the soul is taken through different aspects of turning light or turning darkness into light each division has its own little story and each division has its own serpents that not only pull the uh, bark that carries supposedly the soul but it also lights the way for the soul and communicates the way how to successfully navigate through that hour and division so it's a representation of the duality between light and darkness and it also is represented by the serpents in the Amduat where there are the ones that represent the life force, the light, the eternal creative source that is always there to light in the darkness. But there's also the serpents that represent Apep and they, there's other ones in there that are lesser and greater or uh, but they all represent the all-consuming darkness and chaos that the light shines in and creates life out of and when they tell uh, when they encounter an hour that has the um, battle with a particular serpent in, in there it's an aspect of the soul to overcome that particular darkness and create order out of that chaotic that very primal dark chaotic darkness so the serpent that is entwining the Hecker staff is representing that duality in the Amduat where you have the spirit of of life and fire and creativity that is eternally light and creative but you also have the eternal darkness and chaos that is continually there trying to destroy and consume and be all darkness and chaos so these two constantly exist in eternal struggle with each other and that's represented partially in the binding of the two snakes around the Hecka staff so that's the snakes around the Hecka staff now the Hecka staff itself and I'm calling it the Hecka staff because um, Moses used a staff and I dare say it would have been a Hecka staff now Hecka is the Egyptian word for magic and uh, what I've done with Egyptian hieroglyphs I'm going to give my own interpretation not what others give so if you're expecting to find what I'm saying written somewhere else I don't translate things that way um, as I said I try in past videos I try to go for the purest source and come up with my own interpretations so the Heka staff basically Heka magic is part of creation there are several creative forces and Heka is essential to one of them now I don't want to go too much into it because I'll get sidetracked and way off subject but Heka consists of two distinct um, concepts the He and the Ka now the Ka is the soul and 
in Egyptian mythology, there are three aspects to the soul. The Ka is that part of the soul that has come into a reality to inhabit that particular reality. And in fact, um, karma, which is karma, is when, um, well, all right, I'm not going to explain that right here. I'll explain Heka. That's a completely different subject. So we've got the ka, the soul coming in, that is the um, inhabiting soul. Basically, you've got the ka soul in your body. When you die, that ka soul will leave and join another part, which is called the ba. Now, these days, we could call the ba the higher self, and other people have got lots of different names for it, but while you're inhabiting the form, that part that is your soul experiencing this reality is the ka and that will transmit its information to the bar part once you leave and die and go on blah 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 so that's what the car part of the staff is now the he or the h um, is better described as if listen to the sound of when you breathe out if you take a big deep breath in and you let that breath out. That is what he is. It is the voice of creation. It is the word. It, it is the coming out. It is the expression. As Nassim Harriman explained it, that it is in the concept of quantum mechanics where you've got the expanding universe concept where you've got this balloon being pumped up and expanding out and it's constantly doing that and essentially Nassim Harriman made that thing in the physics department about well I understand all that but who's that blowing the balloon up and that's the thing the balloon was getting blown up by the breath out and that is the concept of the expression of the creative forces coming out of source out of uh, out of nothing it is where something is distinguished from nothing I suppose you could say it is the point of where light, um, light comes from darkness so the breath out is that expression of that light with creative intent so the heka or the magic is when the ka or the the physical soul that's inhabiting your body uses uses that physical expression that breath out to create life, to create in that physical reality. So, and then um, that's just the Heka staff itself. At the top, we have wings. Now, these wings have been used a lot throughout uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, and they're usually used over the top of things, and they indicate that essentially there's a soul in residence that the soul has taken on form it's in flight and it's moving and experiencing so when you look at the symbol that the medical industry use it carries a lot of ancient meaning that goes back to the time of the pyramids and who knows how much further where they actually ever got it from that there is a distinct binding intimated of the soul and the magic or the creative aspect of you in your physical form and it's bound by the duality of two serpents 
it is controlled. Now I'll put that screw in there to indicate to you because that's pretty much what the binding of the two serpents do to you. They wrap you in their own control mechanism. You still exist inside it, but you are controlled by it. And you are no longer a free winged soul inhabiting your physical form and creating. You are not the Heka staff with the winged soul on top. You are bound by the duality created by two serpents. And that is the symbol that the medical industry use. And so when you consider that concept of the symbology, the meaning of the word hypocrite, I mean where did the word hypocrite come from? Was Hippocrates the father of hypocrites? But anyway, I only tell you that to make you think about the medical industry. It has long been corrupted. And what I said up the top here about all doctors were scientists, they all were. To understand how to treat the human being, they had to understand everything about their environment and what was going on in it. They were scientists of every field. They weren't just specialists in one. And they didn't treat human beings as just a disease like the medical industry do, with something that can be fixed by artificial means. Nature has all the cures, and we've had them for a long time. So I'll just, yeah, we'll start that back up again because we're going to, I've got completely off subject because we were going here into uh, knowing your enemy, and the medical industry is one of your enemies and you should know exactly how they are your enemy. You should listen to the nurses and doctors coming out. Now you're probably wondering, this is a rather obvious thing to show about knowing your enemies. The cops, police cars, nobody likes to see them. But it really isn't that obvious about what I'm going to say because there are two issues here that you should be aware of that cops have to live with. We only have to face it every now and again. Now I've just put up a light spectrum wave there. Well more than just light. You can see the visible light range. Somewhere in there is 5G too, and all your other Gs. But this particular thing that I'm talking about here is the police lights. Now I'm uh, light sensitive, and I found that uh, the police had changed their lights, their flashing lights, not only the colour, but now they had alternating colours. And I found them exceptionally agitating. Uh, I could almost have them flashing in my face and within about 30 seconds I'm getting to a stage where I'm wanting to control punching those lights out to stop what is um, welling inside me from it. So I thought, why is it doing this? So I went online and I went and had a look around and I looked at the studies uh, about the flashing lights. Now what I found out is that um, the change in the flashing lights was a controversial one because it was raising the frequency of the lights to such a point where it was possibly creating the opposite effect of warning people it was creating a moss to a flame effect and this was proven on um, scientific information about how they know that certain rhythms will 
um, cause you to be like a deer in headlights. You will be entranced by that light and by that flickering. So I looked at this report and it was clear that despite all the warnings made that they decided to introduce these flashing lights that would take human beings to the very edge of what would be borderline criminal and dangerous. And I thought, well, that's really pushing it to the boundaries with everyone. They, they deliberately set them at that. There was no need to do that. People can see flashing lights. You don't need to make them the way that they have. But if that's not enough, that you would think that, all right, so this flashing sequence, the frequency that it's creating and how often they are flashing is actually creating brain entrainment and it is uh, causing disruptions to brainwave activity. This is a known scientific um, thing. They've, they've shown this. But I want you to have a look at the uh, little light spectrum scale here. You'll notice that on one end is red and on the other end is blue. Now I discovered red shift and blue shift before I discovered fl police flashing lights had changed and all of this. So I understood that all right, so they've changed the frequency but they also changed them from being two blue lights to one blue and one red and the frequency that they were creating was actually going between opposite ends of the light spectrum. So if you look over here on the light spectrum you can see as I explained you've got blue at one end and red at the other. So what you've got are lights that are constantly flashing and whether you real, uh, realize it or not, those signals are actually hitting contradictions in your brain. Because of the opposite uh, light spectrum end, they are contradictions. So that's how I figured out that what I was experiencing, why I was getting agitated, is because I was experiencing the contradictions of imagine that blue is come and uh, red is stop or you know one is go one is stop so you have got not only come uh, stop go stop go stop go flashing in your face but it is flashing at such a rate to be borderline dangerous where it can create a moss to a flame effect and actually draw you in to create an accident. Now the funny thing is that, well I shouldn't say funny, but uh, in looking at all these police things in Victoria, in April there were cops that had pulled over, I think it was a Porsche on the side of the uh, highway. They're standing on the edge of the highway and all four cops get cleaned up by a truck. Now, did they get cleaned up by the truck because of their flashing lights? Was that like a, um, a moth to a flame? It is borderline, it is known, a known effect. So not only when they approach you are, are these flashing lights creating this effect in you, but they go around with these flashing lights left on all the time and they're constantly put in this state of come go, come go, come go. They are living with that contradiction. So it doesn't take much to set them off. You have to understand that where you can get upset by that when you see those flashing lights, that's a built up accumulative effect of contradictory frequency that they have been exposing themselves to. And they have no idea where their depression comes from or their anger or anything like that. But that's enough on the light frequency. 
because um, another reason for understanding your enemy and how these light frequencies come into play not only on you but on them and how you may find them predisposed to get angry quickly because they're kept in a state of confusion between the red and the blue shift. But anyway, look at the metal picture there with um, the young copper. Now look down to his hip. Well, his little safety vest there. Do you see all that stuff that's attached to his hip there? Now I happened across this at the same time I found the light frequency stuff because I was looking in the um, Queensland University for the studies and other universities around for studies on particular things and I came across this one on transponders and it's like well this is very interesting. Now here's something that they don't advertise and I'm sure that they don't even talk about it much amongst the cops because nobody wants to face it themselves either. But the subject of this uh, Queensland, Uni I think it was Queensland University um, study, was the frequency of cancers that were starting to develop in police officers within a five year period of being exposed to those transponders. And I think that the reason that they associate it with, and they called them transponders, I don't know what they're actually called, they call them radios or walkie talkies, but um, they, uh, they had localised cancers, much as children and adults are now suffering more brain cancers on the side of the head where they use the mobile phone. There is an association with the development of cancers and the use of technologies. So it is a known thing and this was oh, eight years ago that these uh, transponders were known to cause because they operate at a heavier frequency than your well back then than your mobile phone used to and they carried it permanently on their hips they were constantly exposing themselves to high level frequencies and electromagnetic radiation and that exposure uh, through clinical diagnosis and study uh, is believed to have caused cancers. So it is a known issue and I don't think they would be shielding the police any more than they're shielding anyone else from their dangerous radiations. I mean they're putting up 5G, they're putting in more radiation operating at higher frequencies, not less. So this is what the police, um, the Queens, uh, Queensland Victoria Police Force have got going. This is what you could look forward to if you got too lippy with the police and too many people um, created what they call a threat of violence. You could be someone not wearing a mask who could try to run away and they might bring in the big boys. Well that's a bit of an exaggeration but uh, wait for it. This was on a previous video about the Victoria Police. You can watch that and learn all about them. I'm not going to re-explain what you can face we all know the police are the main line of opposition and enforcing control over the citizens. Yes, crowd control. And they're doing it all for our own benefit, for our own safety.
Yeah. There's only one problem with that. I don't buy it. And neither do a lot of people. So what do you do? How do you tip the scales so they balance out again? Can we rely on the law? Well, if you look at Lady Justice here, she's got a lot of mythology behind her and I'm not going to explain too much about her but she's standing on the heads of others. She's ruling over. And probably the classic representation of Athena, she carries the scales of justice in one hand and the sword of justice, the jewel-edged sword of justice in the other hand. And the sword, being jewel, swings both ways as does the scales. I'm just going to pause this for a sec and bring up some legal stuff. So I opened up all these tabs to try and give an overview. Now I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. What these are is merely examples and my experience because over the years I have heard so many different people talk about becoming sovereign, declaring themselves free of the tyranny of government and the freedom of oppression and all of these different things and I've pretty much heard everyone talk about you know how you can do it and when you ask them well yes that sounds like a really good idea but how do you actually do it and every time you'd ask them all you'd get was them just repeating this idea this ideal no one was ever really telling you how to do it and that's um, something that I've found that a lot of people are actually starting to explain a lot better today what certain aspects are because what you can do as a human being you have got a few avenues that are open to you it depends on which avenue works for you and which perspective you hold now the common law is something that if you're dealing with the common law, you see all those other tabs that are up the top? They go out the window. Because common law basically deals with the inalienable right that you were born with. It is something that you cannot be take, uh, have taken away from you. And every country recognises common law and personal sovereignty. And that comes over and above and before any law that man imposes, which is all those other tabs. So when it comes to law, common law is kind of uh, the one that beats them all. But it's also something that if you want to use that common law, you still have to take it into a court that is created to deal with uh, legislated law and not common law and put forward your case and have that judge rule on it. So essentially um, it, it's a kind of a cockeyed system. You can also get that common law looked at in the international court and the international court is available to anyone. I mean the Pope is a convicted pedophile in the uh, international court. They, they've got a warrant out for him. They've been chasing him for the last year. But anyway, let's not get off the subject again. So you're going out and about. If you're living in Victoria, you're already going to face the fact if you're not wearing a mask, 
um, you're going to get into trouble. And even if you are wearing a mask, how long are you going to wear a mask? Can you wear a mask and still maintain your self-dignity and not want to just... <laughs> I mean, seriously. How long can you take being treated like a mindless slave? So you have to look at the options and if you are not living in a place where masks are mandatory you have to look at what people are going through and know that it's coming for you after them so we need to help and, and back up those that are already going through it because we're going to be there soon if we don't help them stop this right in its tracks so the arguments that you can use are common law Now, in Australia, it doesn't matter what you do, what law you pick at, you're going to be looking at something that is based on the Australian Constitution. Now, I could get into a long discussion here about what the Constitution is and how many debates there have been at different sections of uh, years over different things to do with the Constitution why people say that at different stages it's not even a valid constitution. But you can still use that constitution as I showed in a previous video with a man back in 2013. You can use this constitution to give yourself rights. If you understand how to use them, you can apply them very well. But if you're someone that's actually trying to discredit the Constitution and say it has no power, then of course you're certainly not going to use it to try and argue your case with. So I'm just merely pointing out all these different aspects because there are lots of different arguments. Every, th there are so many people that are trying to change the way that Australia is governed and ruled. And if you look here, at the very beginning of the Constitution of Australia, we are ruled as a federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And we are a possession of the Queen. Now it says it there in simple black and white, and the whole Constitution just rules out basically what the Queen says we can and can't do. And all the laws that we've got, well they're not laws, Look up here, you see that? It's called the Constitution Act. It's an act because they're actors acting on behalf of the Queen under the Crown. They make acts, regulations and provisions. The only laws that are made in Australia carry the signature of the Queen. And if you think I'm wrong, as I thought when someone said that, oh, that's bullshit, that's wrong, we make our own laws. Well, I was about to find out that person was right. At the very end, by royal consent, and the only way that something can come into law is by the Queen's signature and consent. Anything that we have within this whole federal legislative structure and the state structure is formed from all of the conditions that come out of the Constitution that the Queen allows that we can do particular things. And when you look at it, uh, the provisions for pretty much running your own country do appear to give you self-autonomy. But this Constitution tells us clearly that we are under the Crown. So. That's why I'm pointing this out, because if you ignored the fact that, um, you know, and you wanted to believe, like a lot of people, that no, we are not under the crown, we're sovereign, and this constitution gives us all the rights, we won't worry about challenging its authenticity, we'll just use sections out of it to argue our cause. And a lot of judges are happy for you to do that, because they don't want you to challenge the constitution itself. I mean, Gough Whitlam got sacked for it. Well, that and a few other reasons but I'm not going to get into that anyway and that would take us back to 
the Australian constitutional crisis of 1975. Yes, Sir John Kerr, Gough Whitlam. I remember it. I was alive back then. I was still a kid, but I remember it. So, because we're working under a quarantine condition that the Governor-General of Australia, who is the Queen's representative in Australia and the acting head of Australia, the only person that can sack, sack the Prime Minister and did in 1975. He called a state of emergency over health conditions and it brought into play the Biosecurity Act of 2015. So anything that comes under that is has to be in guidance with the Biosecurity Act. Now all these little tabs here I've got open here because in the previous video I showed how this guy in Victoria was using the Crimes Act of 1958 section 458 to pretty much put this cop in his place and tell him that if he did not stop harassing him he would exercise his rights under section 458 of the Crimes Act of 1958 and take him into the court and arrest him for harassment. Now that is the particular section in Victoria that gives you, a Victorian citizen, the right for that. But each state has its own specific um, act that deals with that and it's not the same act, it's not the same act number. But all of them have to work in conjunction with uh, where are we? I'm not sure which one this is. Alright, I'll take it back here. That's the Northern Territory. But um, one of these tabs up here I can't readily identify is actually the Commonwealth Crimes Act. Or maybe I closed that one, I can't see it. But all of these criminal codes have come into being because of the Commonwealth one and they have to work in conjunction with that. So every state and territory have their own one. Now I'll just take you through so you can see that the Northern Territory is using the Criminal Code Act 1983. And I just looked that one up as to where the powers come in and you would look here um, down here, power of arrest without warrant by other persons. So if you were in the Northern Territory, you'd quote this particular section, which is 218, and the particular act, which is, what was it? The Criminal Code Act of 1983, because that's what gives you the authority to act. Now, technically speaking, when an officer approaches you, a cop, he's supposed to be able to quote all this exact information too because this is how you know. He knows that he's authorised to act. He has to identify that authority. All summons and legal documents have to identify what act that gives them the permission to do things. So... Uh, yes, that was just bringing up that section, what that section actually says. Now here in South Australia, that was a little bit of a... South Australia, you're going to have a lot of fun if you want to try and figure out where that section is because it's a hodgepodge. It's called the Criminal Law Consolidation Act. And it's... Um, It's got lots of, even as a consolidated act, it's lot, got lots of components. And it's, it's hard to find the core component of the criminal law or the criminal code because this, 
that actually uh, the criminal law is more on the application side of it not the actual code side of it so yeah that's a minefield that uh, I couldn't give you too much on a COVID-19 emergency responses you will find that lots of places uh, are introducing emergency powers to try and justify the actions that they're doing I'm sure so this is the New South Wales one Crimes Act of 1900 likewise I haven't uh, searched through any of these others to find the specific one but they are in there they have to be in there because these um, state and territory acts have to cover the same provisions as the Commonwealth one and it can't take away from anything that the Commonwealth one gives you it can have slight variations because uh, they appreciate that communities, cultures, locations, geography, you know, all these different factors can come into play that uh, need variance. So that's New South Wales Act, Queensland Crim uh, Criminal Code Act 1899, Western Australia Criminal Code Act, Compilation Act 1913, Tasmania, the Criminal Code Act of 1924 and that was the oh this is the Victoria one yes this is the act that the um, man in the video previous video was referring to and section 458 that he was talking about is person found committing offences may be arrested without warrant by any person already opened that up but we'll open it up again so this is that section and I'll show you this section because uh, this one I'm pretty sure makes reference to going to see what is actually classified as a crime uh, look I'm not going to go too much into it here because uh, this will end up too long otherwise but essentially um, it makes reference to the fact that there are two appendix or schedules whatever they want to call them at the end of this that specify what is constituted as crimes and arrestable behavior and they're in A and B so that was just a little thing to show you about how that there are different levels of action that you can take you can use your own local act you can use a commonwealth act you can use the constitutional rights given to you you can use the common law or you can in so many respects like I have got to the stage where you realize that everything that is written on paper is corruptible and if you want to try and fight paper with paper you want to fight a law with another law all you're going to be doing is chasing your tail to a large degree I mean you may meet some success but anything that involves going to court in any way shape or form is going to take time and it is going to be something that will consume your efforts and it's best left to those that like that guy in that video that had it well said you can show your support for someone like that and uh, as in uh, two videos ago upload where the guy was talking about common law and the efforts that they're trying to coordinate throughout the world they have someone that can speak all that stuff like that guy did outside that courtroom to that copper and made him go away they've got someone to do that all you need to do is show up and be a number to be part of the solution you don't have to argue anything you just have to be there so if that's all that you are putting at risk when someone else can do all the talking give it a go find out what they're doing 
I've left, I'll leave links for these things where you can join up to this global initiative. You never know, it might go somewhere. On the other hand, we may have problems because we're working with a rigged system to begin with. And we're already using platforms that are rigged against us, monitored, and yeah. So, I mean, how can you organise a protest without anyone knowing? You communicate to online, they know online, next thing you stop. So, the ability to organise through the good old fashioned means of using phones and letters where basically they weren't intercepted and monitored by outside sources all the time. We've forgotten how to do that and maybe we should start using snail mail and going back to good old landlines. I don't know. Do they tap the landlines? I suppose they do. They're all tapped. I mean, they were always tappable, but anyway, so I'll just pause this again and take back to the video. And so I wonder if I've taken you off into enough different uh, side tracks and completely off the track that maybe some of you may have forgotten why I even started this video. But I haven't. Because uh, what justice are we going to get? Now, you might think this is a weird looking... Um, image but I deliberately did this and I will explain it because the next one is going to get even weirder because in the in the beginning there is the balance okay a natural balance then man came along and took charge over it and lauded it and created an imbalance and so that's where I've got Lady Justice who is sometimes wearing a blindfold, which is pretty dangerous for someone carrying a sword, isn't it? But anyway, showing that justice over the natural balance. That's what this image is supposed to indicate. Man having judgment over the natural balance. Because in this next little one, was anyone expecting this? Because not only do we have the natural balance that is out of whack, that has been ruled over by man, but that out of whack balance is also associated with something that also goes back to Egyptian mythology. And the actions that people are doing or not doing today, is anyone considering the consequences of their own actions? I see that um, Shane, pa I think his name Shane Patton, is it? The Victorian Police Commissioner. He stands there and says that people can't get away with doing the wrong thing and they will be held accountable. And I talk back to him and I say, you're damn right, mate. I am going to hold you accountable. You have done the wrong thing. You are not above the law. And there has to be some scale of justice and balance. So I've used the image of the ancient Egyptians weighing of the soul against the feather to indicate this is the kind of spiritual warfare that human beings are under at the moment. Now whatever religion you practice or spirituality or uh, philosophical um, beliefs, there are certain things that you can't escape. Death is one of them. And if you live long enough, you also understand that it's very true when they say there's cause and effect. Now, you can go through life and you can live it materially and acquire a heavy heart 
It's like they say in the Bible where uh, it is far easier for a rich man to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for him to get into heaven because his heart is so consumed with material things that everything that is good and right has been taken from his soul and his heart will be that heavy that, well, that heart on the left hand side, it couldn't get any lower. So this battle that we're undergoing right now is a battle for our soul. On the right here we've got Hermes or Thoth, the scribe, represented as the scribe. He's probably recording the deeds. In the middle, the crockhead is Amet. That if you're found to be, um, if your heart is found to be heavier than the feather, Amet's going to devour your soul. Amet's called the devourer of souls or destroyer of souls or destroyer of millions. I mean, there's many different translations. And then we've got Anubis, who is in charge of the scales. So we've got the balance, the natural balance of, the, of nature that is skew if, that is tied in with the natural balance of the human soul being lorded over by the laws of man. So when I offer s different scenarios, I don't suggest that any one thing is the solution. And sometimes I've tried legal solutions and you realise that yeah, well, there's reason justice wears a blindfold because there is no such thing as justice in the law system. But uh, that's enough of the history lesson and the legal system. This is all something that you can do to know your enemy and know yourself, know what you're capable of. Because what you have at your command is much more. People say, oh, they've taken the guns, we've got nothing to defend ourselves with. Well, for years, I, I used to play softball when I was a kid, and I had that softball bat, I still do, and I also acquired another bat. And then I went out and I bought two metal bats because they were, you could use one in either hand and they they weren't hard to manoeuvre and swing around and I find them also quite handy to if you've got a a stray dog that wants to come into your place and try and give you grief bang them together the the clinging actually hurts their ears and you starting to charge at them you can push them back but I just want people to start thinking about the fact that you are not helpless there are many different things I want to look at Farmer Joe down here with his whips. I tried using a whip once and I took a chunk out of my behind. I'm not very good at it. And pea shooters, well, I think I've been on the worse end of those than I have been of doing it to others. And what about my little slingshots? Yeah, well, I've broken a few windows with that. <laughs> And the softball too. And you're probably wondering why there's a whistle and pepper in there. Alright, they make pepper spray. And you might not want to go out and buy expensive pepper spray and you might not want to have to search for it. And you know, everyone has pepper, ground pepper. You can get ground pepper very easily. And all you've got to do is take the lid off or if you've got one of those twist lids, turn it around a bit and just squeeze and a whole puff of, um, you know, pepper powder is going to come out. And that, that's not very nice up your nose and in your eyes. And one of the things, being a, a cooking condiment too, if the, you were happening to carry that down the street and someone was in distress, been attacked by cops and you happen to accidentally um, 
the top fell off and went in their faces and they went wreathing to the ground and couldn't do anything and everyone ran away. <laughs> okay. Um, are you with me? Um, there are ways that you can deal with things without needing a gun or a knife because the more threat you carry, the more threat you're going to meet in resistance to you. And why a whistle? All right, now, years ago when I was in high school, I used to do bushwalking. And one of the f biggest safety things that we always used to have to take with us was a whistle. Because if you get into an emergency situation, if you become weak, exhausted, dehydrated, um, hypothermic, or whatever condition you might find yourself in, you've been lost, you can't yell out loud enough but a whistle can certainly get the point across you, uh, a whistle can echo across valleys and you don't have to yell it out if um, we've all had dreams where you try to call for help and you can't call for help or you try to run and you can't run it's the same thing when you are in a stress situation it is really hard to actually try and call out really loudly for help, uh, especially if someone is trying to, to stop you from doing that. But what is very easy is to stick a whistle in your mouth and blow and call. Now, it used to be an old method. Look here. You see this with the old bobbies? They not only used to carry a whistle, but they also used to carry a stick. A nice little whacking stick. So if they saw a crime being committed, they'd blow on the whistle to alert everyone to that. So that people could come in and help. And that's what you can do. You can carry a whistle. If you need help, blow that whistle call out for help, say police are harassing me and go to people's aid. Do not ignore people that are in, in need. Do not stand by and video them, please. But I can also help you with a way to get around that in a minute. So not only carry a whistle so that you can call for others to come in because there's always going to be someone around that's going to hear that whistle. You hear a whistle and people call for help. Go help them. And as you can see here, even a kid can do it. Now the funny thing was that when I was looking up for whistles, it came up with whistleblower and... You know, a few years ago, that word never meant anything. But you can be a whistleblower, a real whistleblower. Help your community, everyone carry a whistle. And your call for help will go further and wider. And if you coordinate that whistle, if the cops are coming at you, you coordinate that whistle with... Um, pulling out that little bit of pepper you've just got in your pocket handy dandy and just squeezing it so that a puff of pepper, pepper comes out in their direction um, already you're starting to look like you've got this situation a little bit more under control and they're, they're not going to be as much of a threat to you as what they want to think they are and then you can use other examples of where uh, you can make your own arrest and they could turn around and say, well, you assaulted them. Uh, how? Uh, you put pepper in their face? Uh, no, I didn't. I had pepper on me and you came and invaded my space and because you did that, um, I had an accident and it spilled. It's not my fault, it's yours. Are you with me? Are you hearing me, people? Think of what you can say. And don't wait until you go through it because sooner or later... All of us are going to go through it in one way or another. So you need to know what to say beforehand, not when you get there. So what can you do? A lot. A lot. 
Now, facial recognition. I find this one an interesting subject because they've brought up the thing about how they want to, you know, they've got facial recognition and cameras everywhere. They want to identify everyone. And now all of a sudden they want everyone to wear masks. But uh, look at the uh, imaging here of uh, the fellow with uh, the two images, with the dots and the geometry lines. Now you can see if he's wearing a mask, how many points of identification that will cover up. However, look at how many are still available just around his eyes. There are probably more points of identification around his eyes than there are around the whole entire bottom part of the mouth that he's masked up. Now, you can understand why they ask you to take off your sunglasses because they can't map your eyes if you're wearing sunglasses, especially block out ones that can't see through them. So, I then think, well, if you are living in a place where masks are mandatory, you've got several options. You can follow the rules or not follow the rules. And if you are following the rules begrudgingly, sooner or later, you don't want to follow the rules and you're going to find yourself in trouble. But what if you did abide by what they said? What if you did mask up? And in doing so, you not only beat their facial recognition technology, but you also show to every other human being out there that you are willing to be defiant of what's what the government are trying to impose, what they are trying to take. And yes, uh, Anon. I like some of Anon's stuff, but I also know that Anon, like you, has got its uh, questionable elements. But uh, that's not my point here. My point is that if we all wore anonymous masks, imagine if you walked out and instead of seeing someone in a surgical mask, you saw someone in an anon mask, and then you saw another one and another one. And in looking at that person wearing the anon mask, you know this person is on the side of humanity and if we have to play this game of masking up let's do it let's do it right because every day that this charade goes on the elite agenda running this world is losing sheep more and more people are waking up to what is going on because there are so many contradictions that even the most brainwashed are starting to question, hey, something's going on. So daily, they're losing their sheep and they're waking up. And a lot of those sheep are young. And they're going to be out there wearing these anon masks. They're going to be leading the forefront of the fight. So maybe we should jump on that bandwagon with them. I've looked at buying an anon mask. And if it wasn't for the fact that my daughter wouldn't go out in public with me if I wore one right now, especially since we are not even under, there's no one with... COVID in Tasmania and no one's wearing a mask. Oh, hang on, I saw a, an Asian woman wearing one in a car the other day and we both laughed at it. But, um, yeah, she disowned me. She's already embarrassed enough to go out in public with me because she never knows what I'm going to say. But this is what you can do. I, I'm not offering clear-cut solutions. I'm not telling you how you can put, integrate this into your life, even if you can integrate it. These are just merely things that if you look at, I look at what I can use, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, 
And this is where it goes back to know your enemy and know yourself. What works for me is not going to work for another human being. The things that I've tried in some circumstances work for me and in other circumstances don't. It depends on the situation a lot of the time. So every person needs to start looking at what they can do to show that even in our masked anonymous we are defiant and we're giving them the big finger up. We really do need to start thinking about a few things. And I think I've gone on for long enough. I've come to the end of my slides and I know this because I made them with all the notes and the images so that I would be prompted to discuss the things that I have. And I knew I would get off track and I don't know how long this video is, but I want you to understand. There are things that each and every one of us can do. Your inalienable rights, you are born with them. They cannot be taken from you by a piece of paper. And the laws that I showed you before are mutable. They are completely changeable. They're not set in stone. And in the greatest sense of that, the only thing that can truly be law is that which is eternal and perpetually immutable. Like universal law, the laws of creation, the laws of cycles. And even though the laws of cycles, like the natural cycles that we have, allow for variations within them, the overall cycles governing them are not. They are invariable. They are cycles. They are bound by the cycles. And they are infinite. So what are laws? What are, what are we obeying? Are we obeying the laws of man? The laws of our conscience? The laws of our birthright? Are we doing because other people have told us that we should? Are we allowing the government that we elected to serve us tell us what we can and can't do? I've shown in past videos that you do not have to take that that because of their position, a public position and the position they hold, they actually hold less rights. The politicians and the police hold less rights than what you do. You, in your individual power, with all, even the means that are available to you on paper, you may or may not be successful, but there are areas that you can be successful in, people have been successful in, and they've created precedents. And do you want to sit back and be part of the problem? Or do you want to be part of the solution? And if we, w if we must, must wear a mask, well, in one way we all wear one of our own making. So let's make it one that shows others we are in this together, one together. If everyone, look, I'd not love nothing more than if I walked out, if I was living in Melbourne and I saw everyone wearing a non-mask, I would know then that we could do something about it and change things. It's something to think about anyway. In some ways, I wish I was in Victoria because I'd be certainly doing a lot of things. I'd probably be arrested by now anyway, but, well, I'm probably in the place where I'm supposed to be right now. It's a long video. I've talked on a lot. I've covered a lot of things, and I've taken you into different areas. I'm, I've hoped that I've made you think 
that the reality that you're experiencing and, and the problems that you're going to encounter are going to include medical and police. These are your two major issues right now. And to deal with them, there are certain things you need to deal with first. All of us need to deal with. And the first thing we all need to deal with is, who are you? What do you believe in? And what are you going to stand up for? And when are you going to stand up?